We're also joined by Amin. Come on down. We've got one more microphone. Bring it back down. What's the going game. on, guys? How you doing? Yeah. How are you game. doing, Amin? <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is always nice to be here. Yeah. yeah. Back in the fishbowl. Yeah, back in the fishbowl. What are you guys been up to today? Just hanging out, trying to get some interviews going. Yeah. Dan's recovering. Needs more liquids. Yeah, that's all, oh, man. Yeah. You'll get around to it. Yeah. It was a good one. Yeah. And we just found Max. He's back. I'm back. Yeah. 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 Not like I've seen you around. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe so, not down here. Yeah. So you, you've been traveling all over Mexico, right? And and doing a, a little documentation. What, what was that all about? Um, the documentation is different to traveling. So I've been traveling. I, I landed in Acapulco for Ana Acapulco. So the event organized by Dalla Vigilante and Jeff Berwick and that. Interesting event. And uh, after that, I went to Oaxaca, which is a you know it's quite a poor state. But it's a place where most of the fruits and produce is like comes from, you know. And uh, yeah, I've been living there. It's a very interesting place. Very, very like powerful culture. A lot of uh, the customs remain and the way of traditional way of living and like tortilla, they make it like in, in such an old school way. And like, it's amazing. It's really, really eye opening location to be with. Yeah, I went to um, uh, tourist need at Cancun and, um, you know, we did a little tour. And sort of Chichen Itza and all that, and um, I hadn't actually realised, but there's still like there's still Mayans around. So even that's though, right. Yeah, this, this that's right. So like I went to Chiapas, which is another state, which is also a very very poor state. So the southern states, because they don't have the industrial services, so you know like uh, you know the modern I guess uh, the methods of making money, um, they're much poorer. Even though they produce the most amazing like coffee and chocolate and tobacco and like fruits and. You know, most mm. of the real stuff comes from there. Well, we live in a different world, I guess. Uh, we need banks to make money. Um, so, yeah, in Chiapas, I went to a place called Palenque, and it's in the jungles. And I was in a van, and the guy was speaking, and I'm like, this doesn't sound like Spanish, you know? I'm like, what are you speaking? And he's like, oh, it's Mayan. Mm. And, like, it is, like, this is honest thought that I had, and I'm like, I thought you got wiped out. Yeah, you know, because yeah. like, that they were pre-Incan, weren't they? Were they it'd be pre mines were before, way before they were like thousands. historically. I can't. I can't. Yeah, I think yeah. I still, I still got there's the Aztecs, there's the Incans, uh, there's the uh, Mayans, mm -hmm. and there's a what's the one from Oaxaca? But like, there's five different uh, indigenous groups that I know of, and then there's many other, I guess, yeah. branches of it. I actually visited. I think it was 2012. Um, was it 2012? Yeah. So, I, so the first question, obviously, I asked. And the world's gonna mine, end. Yeah. yeah. Why, why is the world gonna end? They're like, no, it's just a bloody cycle. It's just literally <laughs> like you know, ticks over and starts again. Right? Yeah. I thought you had to flip over the calendar and start again. Then that's what I heard. Yeah, that's basically it. It's yeah. a round calendar, and it was yeah. two sided, and you just had to flip over and start again. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> oh right. We, it reminds we me interpreted of, that as the end of the world. Yeah, that's right. They're probably like, the just pace. relax. Just flip it over. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's fine. We ran out of space. You know? <laughs> yeah. they, they should have increased the block size by two. Yeah, yeah. there you go. Calendar blocks, bigger. Oh man. Yeah, it's in, it's incredible being in these regions. I mean, like as a person that got into it with the intention that Bitcoin was supposed to be applied for emerging economies and people without access to uh, what we take for granted. I mean, it's important to go there and see what's going on because like you're only as strong as your weakest link and you need to figure out like what's going on in those regions and how you can help people there. And it's incredible. You know, I did this whole uh, three piece story on uh, how cryptocurrencies could be used within emerging uh, economies like Mexico and Latin America and also how biometric technology. I mean, oh, do you know about like the whole thing happening in India? Like 1.1 or 1.2 billion uh, people were onboarded onto their uh, system. I forget the name of it. Do you know the one in India? Like, yeah, I forgot the name of it, but it's, it's all by, with biometrics. And a lot of people who are on welfare and these things could not receive it unless they registered. And uh, I mean, it's one thing to say, hey, this is a new system, opt in if you like. And another thing is to be like, if you want your welfare, come and like give us your retina scan, you know? So you got to force people to sign up just like that uh, Facebook messenger Yeah, they made you sign up on your phone. You had no choice at all. Yeah. And like you use the application. I used to be able to do it on my phone, but you can't even access it anymore. So it's quite interesting to have these kind of perspectives that go back and forward. Hey. Sorry guys, Catering just coming in. We ah, have bullet, bulletproof so right. coffee flying in ah, left ah, and right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bulletproof coffee as opposed to 
feed your brain. So yes. Oh. I had one this morning. It fed my so brain. <laughs> You're a darling. Thank, Thank you very much, Martin. Cheers. Yeah, that was nice of him. Cheers. Enjoy. Yeah. You guys probably haven't moved from here for a couple of hours. We're not allowed yeah. to leave. Uh, we're locked in the basement. Oh, yep, wow. yep. You cannot leave the fishbowl once you're in here. Oh, wow. Locked forever. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's an IT thing, is it? Because, like, you know, it, IT just gets pushed down to the basement, doesn't it? So <laughs> <laughs> that's cooler down here, better for the computers. Yeah, yeah. it's like the IT here, crowd, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, they're in the basement. <laughs> Have you tried turning it off and on again? Yeah. <laughs> I love that show. It was very, like, representative of the culture. It always works, yeah. Yeah, I was. I've been talking about, I guess, uh, a lot of systems. There was a very, very beautiful talk just now by Inbar. You guys should definitely have her on. Um, she's working on a platform called Salam Talk, and it's about a way of allowing decentralized media to occur. So allowing, I guess, people in Israel to have direct communication with people in Palestine, and uh, very, very interesting. Her her talk was very inspiring in many ways because, to give you an example, even in Australia, uh, through Snap Snapchat. I can't keep up with all these plat centralized platforms. Um, but yeah, through Snapchat, uh, a group in Australia started relaying messages about what's happening in the news. So you're walking down the road, you see something, you post it on. Now there's 2 million people feeding this system and the media is getting a bit shaky. So they've come out with statements going, leave it to the professionals, don't involve yourself with this. You know, we've been handling this quite well over the years, guys. And we're like, obviously that's not true. But um, yeah, and I think, I don't know. Like, what do you what do you guys think? Like, like with decentralization, such as like with news, how would you compete with it? You know, you got, you got like two million people feeding it, and how do you compete as a news organization? Like, I'm just trying to think what would be the kind of move. You know, I haven't thought about it. Well, like, the the book I'm reading right now is really interesting, and I keep talking about it. And unfortunately, I haven't been reading it. I've been here, uh, but it's a Neil Stephenson book, and it's called Fail or Dodge in Hell. And the first part's okay. It's kind of about this guy. He's really rich. He passes away, and he's involved in life extension technology. So they're going to take his brain, put him in a computer. But the second part is about the Internet and truth. And there's this hoax where the town of Moab, Utah, is destroyed by a nuclear bomb. And there's a video that comes out, and the town's cut off the Internet, and they cut off the cell phones, and everyone on the Internet thinks it's true. Then one guy goes there, and he's like, no, they're fine. This is a hoax. Somebody scammed it. The video was fake. The other video was fake. They cut off the internet lines. They told the police to put up barricades. It was all a lie. But this kind of causes a schism in culture where there's now people that believe in the bomb and people that don't believe in the bomb. And so oh, one guy wow. comes along and he's like, well, we're going to fix this because they're attacking this woman and they're ruining her reputation. He's like, what we're going to do is we're going to get these bots and there's going to be a swarm of bots and a swarm of bots. And we're going to put every imaginable negative thing on your account so much so that nothing will seem real. So many negative comments, every blog, every open system filled. And then he's going to open source the code to these bots so that anybody can make them so that anybody can make a thousand, a million lies about everyone. Oh, the wow. idea being that this will force people into a new trusted Internet. Everything signed first. Everything true, everything beautiful and cryptographic and wonderful, right? But what happens instead? They overwhelm everyone and no one believes in anything anymore. And now if you want to use the internet, either incoming or outgoing, you have to hire an editor and the editor determines the quality of your information. So if you're rich, you have a good editor. Mm. If you're poor, you subscribe to an edit stream and you get kind of poor information. Oh, the like healthcare. Oh, and it splits everything up. Yeah, it's much like Kafka. And it splits everything up. There's kind of this America stand where they're very religious. And of course, they're watching a religious feed and they believe that Moab, Utah was bombed. They're completely into that. Even though it's there, they still believe it's bombed. You know, and here being at Pralana Police, actually, above on the second floor, there's a, a, a show of pictures uh, where a hackers group here locally in Prague, uh, they, they hacked into a, um, a, what do you, like a weather camera that just shows a landscape. And they hacked into that server um, and, and took a couple seconds of the snippet of that, that live stream and photo edited so that it looked like an atomic bomb was hitting that place. Uh, and then they played that 10 second clip uh, and then they cut the network stream. Uh, and so and that was broadcasted all over live television, yeah. uh, where then ultimately that was exactly that. It was a fake atomic bomb actually made by the hackers here in this place. Well, and more and more that's going to happen. <laughs> and this one was just a random group of people. And the idea being that 
the Russians or the CIA or China or a really well-funded organization could do an even better prank. And that really you just can't believe anything anymore. And it, it really sets them back. It really changes their culture. It is, it is like getting that way, though. I mean, I, I, I'm, I, this, this may sound ludicrous, but I think that YouTube is becoming a better source than the news for me because I can visually see something rather than what someone's interpretation of it is. And, and so many newspapers, you know, it's almost like there's, there's no real fact checking anymore. And, you know, I've fallen, fallen, you know, especially around Brexit, for example, is a classic thing. People sharing all sorts of stuff. And it happened with the US election as well. Um, and yeah, you just, you've got to have your filters on. And I don't think people are really taught enough. And it's going to get even scarier now that they can pretty much on the fly emulate someone's voice. So you could type and I could be, I could emulate Mad Bitcoin's voice. Oh, yeah. And then even worse than that, the, um, you know, visually, we're going to get to a stage where you'll, you'll be a, you know, pixel perfect uh, version and doing something, you know, silly that's going to get you into trouble. Well, have you seen any of the face swapping videos? There's one where there's a Bill Hader, the comedian, and he's doing impressions. So he's doing like Tom Cruise. And while he does Tom Cruise, they change his face for Tom Cruise's face. So now he's doing the voice, but the face is perfect too. And it shifts in and out perfectly. Mm. And it's not, it's, there's no big cuts or anything. This is on YouTube. You can just pull it right up. Bill Hader, uh, what's it called? Deep fake technology, mm. deep fake Bill Hader. Mm. And uh, it's great. Oh, and, the, uh, actually, the voice one, I, I've just remembered, it's Jordan Peterson, I think, was was emulated. Oh, and so and yeah, they made him say a bunch of things he would never say, yeah, of course, yeah, you know, wacky so, things. And yeah, stuff. yeah. And, uh, even, and then on top of that as well, another one um, in terms of AI and how clever that's getting. The, the, they, they can emulate, uh, sorry, yeah, emulate movement from a still picture. So they can take your face and then just, and it's just literally a photo. And they can have you looking like you're talking. They did the Mona Lisa, for example, <laughs> sort of yapping away. It's so, insane. Like all these like simulations and what's happening with the, like, how do you prove you weren't there? You know yeah. what I mean? Like your voice can easily be replicated and modified to say certain things with AI and everything involved. And for me, it's just like, I don't, I don't know what the countermeasure is to kind of protect individuals. Well, but you see that we get plausible deniability. Now, any video about you, you can say, well, no, actually, that wasn't me, right? There yeah. was a deep fake. Uh, so even for the ones that are actually you, you could get away with saying, no, that, that wasn't me. That was just some someone <laughs> hacking the server to get the deep fake on. Yeah, I guess it works both ways. But a couple of things like I've been working on. Um, so I've been working on a pro protocol for the past nearly year called 1M5. So 1M5 is quite interesting for me to kind of be involved with because it allows the uh, messages to be relayed through I2P and Tor. And I2P is very, very important. I mean, everyone's so caught up with Tor, but it's still, you know, limited in many ways it's great for accessing the cleaner in a i guess more private way um but it's limited in yeah. well, sorry no yeah <laughs> i thought you were going to get into it um but with i2p it's a decentralized network so it has no access uh, nothing to do with the cleaner um and what is important is if you use them in combination you can relay messages through i2p until you get to another node which has access to tor and then get to you know access your cleaner so, you know, that's a protocol that's been very interesting for me to work on and be able to embed it within many applications. So one of them is Encrypt, which is a project out of uh, Harvard Business School, and they are developing the MVP should come out in a few weeks. Um, it allows journalists to relay messages, post articles uh, for whistleblowers, for organizations that want to keep their, you know, uh, important or credential, uh, confidential files secure away from hackers being able to get to it. It's very, very important. And also in the case, uh, that the internet gets, like, let's say the Hong Kong protest, Telegram got shut down, right? So uh, the founder of Telegram came out and he said, we got ddos and they look like state-sized uh, attacks. And uh, their guess, I guess, you know, highly educated guess and, you know, analysis proved that to be uh, China. So they wanted to stop the communication from occurring and people to be able to organize themselves. And, uh, you know, that in itself shows, like, so, so the first step we went from, like, Facebook Messenger and, like, WhatsApp, to using you know end-to-end -end encryption and then we had open whisper system and, and then telegram is its own thing which some people don't like it some people do and uh, 
so these still all function within you know clear uh, clear net so they all function within you know our normal uh, premises though to be able to take it to the next step we need to have decentralized networks so you know states can't shut it down if people want to have like a collaboration they want to be on the streets expressing themselves they should be able to do so right as long as there's no harm being done you know the expression of the self and expression of a group of people's opinion should be honored and, uh, you know, at the end of the day, it was interesting case study for me to be able to look at that and go, well, if there was an application, you know, Fire Chat, for example. Sure. Yeah, it was. Um, oh, I forget the name, but the mesh networking guys and they yeah. mesh network chat and they used it for uh, places where there is a fire. It yeah. was one of the ideas. Yeah. And it was Emergency great services. until Google bought it out, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it's a fully proprietary software. So, you know, you can't even access the code and be able to implement it within other applications unless you probably do like some uh, consultation session with them or something. Um, and that was great because it uses direct Wi-Fi. So if, you know, internet gets shut down in a region, what happened in Egypt in 2011, for example, uh, internet was shut down. So people had no way of communicating with each other. Um, having a system like that allows, you know, for example, direct Wi-Fi, I send a message to you and then you send to someone else and we relay across until, especially if you're in an organized group that everyone is so, you know, close premises, you're able to communicate quite efficiently without even needing to rely on ISPs. So that's the next level we want to add to 1M5, which is the direct network. And then it includes direct uh, Wi-Fi and uh, Li-Fi. Do you know Li-Fi, light fidelity? So light fidelity is an emerging technology which uses light to uh, communicate. Um, and they say it's much more secure, it's much more, uh, it's much quicker than compared to Wi-Fi. And uh, it, it bypasses the needs to have, for example, 5G. So, you know, you can have very quick connections using light. Uh, the only issue is obviously bending the light. So, you know, how do you bounce it around? So that's an issue. So it, it's great in like a co-working space if you're just directly in front of the router or something, um, or direct access from one point to another for the light to be able to communicate. So the, well, it's very new, you know, it's, it's very, very new. So all these things have to be tweaked out of it. But and then on top of that, you have meshing networks as well, which are popping up everywhere. And for me, it's like on one hand, we have uh, ISPs and censorship for Internet. But for me, Internet is dead. Like, you know, it's 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 in this. It's, it's just becoming so like with all these news and fake news and media, it's like it's just so much a mess that it's like I'm waiting for the next step. Where's the next step that we can, uh, you know, meet and collaborate and share information? You know, and, and for one side, it's, it's you know, relying on new technologies, like, for example, Wi-Fi or mesh uh, networks. And on the other hand, especially for software, uh, we, we have rather old technologies that are very powerful. Uh, for example, XMPP, right? That's, that's just a messaging server. Right? Yeah. Like, it's very well encrypted. Smuggler, you really Exactly, it, like yeah. the Crypto Hippie. If you've got a Crypto Hippie VPN, you get access to their XMPP server. And it's, like, it's pretty unbreakable. Or I mean, radio. Oh, yeah, exactly. Radio right. frequencies. Like, we want to embed that as well, just having, like, direct radio access. Uh, but unfortunately, like, the air is controlled. You need licensing and all of that if you get it, like, to a you know, broad, broad kind of a case. But please continue, sir. Yeah, so, so it's just a mixture of, of using old technology that is actually useful. Right? For, for example, Slack uh, is based on uh, IRC server, right? the IRC server model. But it's not end-to-end -end encrypted. So it's like it takes some part of a good technology but completely then takes away what makes that technology actually useful and good. Why don't, Why do you think they're unencrypted? You can't uh, hold the customer's data and read it and pre-trade their markets and everything. Yeah. And plus, they own our archive. Like they take everyone's archive if you get too large, and then you have to pay the money to get access to your archive. That's right. Uh, so that's right. Yeah, it's it's a bit of an insidious business model, and I was really uh, disappointed and surprised that they didn't change that when they went public and they got all that money. I would hope they would give us back our archive. And say, hey, now you just subscribe, or now you just subscribe for these features. We're not going to hold you hostage anymore. But now they're still holding the sausage. Oh wow! Yeah. yeah, I guess one of the challenges that comes out, like in these in this day, is like having a decentralized organization. So a DAO or a decentralized autonomous mission, which is what One and Five is. One of the challenges we're really facing is how do you raise money, or how do you how do you? I mean, one form is that you receive money or donation through Bitcoin, and that's fine. But if you want to, you know, scale something, you want to have a largest. So there's two approaches. One is like put a cryptocurrency within your system, which is not very, you know, we all know what's up. So um, and, and that also reduces the security factor of the system because cryptocurrencies can be traced and, you know, it leads to other issues. The other side is that we don't want to register it somewhere. And then how do you ask organizations, let's say uh, journalists without borders and these organizations to support you? The first thing they will, their accountant will say, well, like, 
we need to write this to a company, you know, mm-hmm. like I can't put a DAO on my, on my accounting sheet. So like, I guess based on, you know, you, you know, you guys have spoken to so many people over the years, like what are some tips, I guess, as an organization that doesn't want to be registered in a jurisdiction, still function globally and raise money in a, in a way where I guess like in a respectful way, not just like here's our Bitcoin address, send us something, you know? Uh, what was the name of Justin's software? Oh yeah, I got it. Mistos. So a friend of mine, Justin, uh, took this idea on and he built it on top of Blockstack. So it has the decentralized login. You use Blockstack for the login and then it's called Mistos and it's a multi-signature wallet. Uh, But what it makes really easy is the adding and subtracting people to this and the voting if you want to spend the money. So if you had an organization of, say, five people and you all join the multi-sig, Uh, Then you would send the money to the multi-sig. And then if you want to pay it, like you want to buy some computer chips for your project and four out of the five vote yes, then the money is sent to the computer chip person and later on you'll get the chips. Uh, What's great about Mistos is the problem with multi-sig is every time you want to add or subtract someone from your organization, everyone in your organization has to sign the new multi-sig. So at purse.io, we'd use this. And then when we hired someone new, I'd have to go around and bother all the programmers and scan their thing. And we would do this over and over again. And it's just not doable for a large or a decentralized organization. So what Mistos does is it does all of that in the background. And then you can just vote. If four out of the five vote, they could add the new person or not add the new person. And just basically through multi-sig, you can have a situation where one person can't, can't run off with the money. Now, sure a majority or a plurality could still run off with the money yeah absolutely Um, but just that basic idea of being able to use multi-sig something off the shelf something not built by your team that you can trust because it's from another party and it can be audited it's open source you use this yourself i've tried it yeah yeah. and we don't have a bit similar to aragon have you have you looked into it's like a smart contracts thing i've talked to john about the downside of like I love, I love what they're building, but I don't like systems that are solely dependent on like, especially if you're creating an all encompassing system that's solely dependent on ERC 20 tokens, I would prefer it to be like, use your own currency within the system or whatever fuel that you want to use. Um, but here's the outline of it. And then like a, like a wallet, you know, that would be, that would be nice, but I love what they're doing. They're creating a decentralized courtroom. They're creating, you know, this is decentralized dispute resolution. You can do all of that kind of, uh, uh, traditional corporate needs and uh, functions within their application. And it's quite interesting uh, what they've been doing and they have a whole transparency section so that you see all the payouts they've been doing and if they paid a contractor, you see it all very, very in front of you, transparency.aragon.com or something like that. Um, but yeah, that's one thing. And I've been like really focusing on decentralization and I'm trying to figure out like which way is the best to go. Um, and uh, yeah, I've also been really, uh, since 2017, looked into Decred. You know Decred? Sure. Yeah. Do you have a personal opinion on it? It's another Jake altcoin, it. right? Uh, Jake's, I met Jake a, com- uh, a couple of years ago, actually. It's uh, one of the conferences. And, and actually, Noah from Decred teams helped uh, test on my um, uh, hotel booking platform. Oh wow! And um, but I like I think it's, I think it's great. You know I think that, that um, the, you know the, I like the idea of a governance system where they're able to do stuff. And I, I think it's you know it's it helps the you know helps get the message across. It helps educate people. It helps you know build things. Um, and that's it's kind of Bitcoin doesn't have that. So everyone's self motivated by you know writing code or you know contributing, but not getting a direct reward. So I think yeah. like the idea. Um, and they've also just implemented uh, some, well, some secrecy sort of. Yeah, they added yeah. some security uh, pr- uh, protocol to it, which was based on Coin Shuffle, and it's a much more simpler version of, I guess, what Monero and mm-hmm. Zero Cash and everyone else is doing. It hasn't yet been applied to the transactions, but you for staking, so it has mm-hmm. a sixty thirty ten system, which I quite like. Like I really wish Bitcoin had that as well, where you know, imagine ten percent of the mining. Uh, you know, the, the coins that were mined went to like a decentralized funding. So we wouldn't need like Blockstream yeah. to kind of look after it, um, to, to pay the developers on that. Like I really like these systems that are self-funded. And I think like a lot of more decentralized systems need that. And that's, that, that, that's initially what really drew me to uh, the governance system and the funding system is what drew me to Decred. And I've been, and I tried their proposal system um, and I'll see how it goes. It's interesting to try out these systems and see how the community reacts and like what your thoughts are and yeah. And for me, uh, yeah, it just makes a lot of sense to have a decentralized governance. So even if you have a code or a consensus change to the algorithm or something, the code is ready to be 
implement it. And then once the vote goes through, um, it just gets implemented. You know, and you can't change your opinion on it. And these are very, very interesting tools to kind of describe to people. So in Mexico, I held a workshop to describe it to people. And I was like, imagine the Federal Reserve was like, we need to bail out the bankers. Um, $16 trillion out of your tax money is like paused here. Can we release it to them? No one would vote yes. You know, like, no, but be yeah. like, sure. Well, just work for the rest of our life to pay off that debt. Everyone would be like, no, send them all to jail. Yeah. Um, and once you put that thought into, you know, like a lot of these tools, people just need to, like a paradigm shift needs to occur within their mind. Like sometimes I say to people, I'm like, have you thought, uh, have you ever thought that it's weird that you have a bank account that you pay fees and they go and use your money to make money? Yeah. And like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, it's just like when you put that into people's mind, they're like, yeah, I've never really thought about that. I yeah. thought it was just normal to like pay my fees and like, you know, they go and use your money to do whatever they want. So it's kind of nice to plant these seeds within people's minds. And like, you know, that's again, that's what attracted me to uh, the Decre community. And I'm trying to like figure out like how I feel about it. And like, you know. Yeah, I, I like the idea of having a governance model. Yeah. But I'm not sure the computer geeks are really ready for politics. Uh, mm. It's not quite the scientific realm that you might think it is. It's not quite fact based. It's very popularity based. If it's a simple majority, if it's a 70 30, the two thirds, whatever it is. Uh, you said no one would vote for the bankers. They might, they just might. It depends who your validators are. If your 12 validators are all bankers, they're going to vote for the bankers. Uh, you said that if we could have 10% of the Bitcoin money set to a project, it all depends which project it is, right? It starts out with good intentions, it gets bad. Maybe it starts out with bad intentions, it gets worse. Yeah. Uh, it's very difficult to pull these things back once you've given them the power and uh, things like Dash. Dash has lots of money for marketing, but does that really make Dash better? They had all this talk in Venezuela that Burger King took Dash and oh, and people was of Venezuela, garbage, yeah. and it was absolutely garbage. Yeah. And it's the kind of, but it was marketing. I mean, it, it sold the hype, it sold the project. Maybe it made it go up in that way, success. But does it do anything that's actually really long-term good? I'm yeah. not sure. No, I understand. How would you improve on that, though? You know, like teach well, every political, teach uh, civics again. Teach <laughs> civics classes for everyone. Yeah. And the question is, do you want to have all this complexity on the base layer of a neutral monetary system? But what we're building here is money. Uh, and money shall be neutral and not controlled by any single uh, party. Uh, and, you know, you can build these decentralized organizations on top of a neutral money, but you cannot build a neutral money on top of a decentralized organization, right? In the sense that, well, decentralized organization here in quotes, but if you have such a foundation that receives 10% of, of the money supply increase, uh, that leads to that centralization. And you have this trusted third party then to distribute the money. And the question is, if you get money for free, paid via the increase of the money supply, are you going to spend that uh, prudently and wisely on things that are actually useful in the long term? Uh, and I mean, that is the central planning uh, theory, right? Can a selected group of individuals uh, adequately allocate resources throughout time when they do not have skin in the game, right? Uh, and with Bitcoin, we do not have this, right? Uh, if you want to spend Bitcoin, you first have to earn it, yeah. right? Uh, and the question is, will this lead to more and more adequate resource allocation uh, in the future? Yeah, so I'm really happy you brought up skin in the game. And I feel that is something that should be applied. I mean, the book is so fascinating. You read it and you're like, this solves all world issues. Why aren't we just doing this? You know, like like, a, like the way he put it in the book, he was like, um, a pilot has naturally skin in the game. Whether you like checking the engines or not, your life is at risk. You're going to check the engines, whether you find it fun or not, because like, you are a part of it. If the plane goes down and passengers are at risk, you're at risk. Um, and that for me automatically resolves that issue. And it, it also refers to ancient times where emperors would be at the front line of the battle, like let's go into it. And now the guy sitting in the White House, you know, you got that famous photo of Obama and Clinton in the in the operation room with the general armor, whatever it is. And they're just watching the scene and they're like, whoa, like they should be in that fight, not in their suit, like in some room thousands of miles away from the actual battle scene so for me like that skin in the game is very important but to bring it back um 
with the proposal system, it is the stakeholders that vote on it. So it is the people that have skin in the game. So it is it is an application of skin in the game because you're not going to vote on something because you are a part of that. So, you know, you need to have skin in the game. You need to have a ticket. And to have a ticket, you need to have uh, have to have the coin. You know what I mean? So for me, it's a good approach in that way that you do have skin in the game, that your, that your vote actually uh, has, a, you know, uh, has, has an effect on what you're doing. Um, so that's just like one, one aspect of it that I quite enjoyed. But that skin in the game book, it's, it's, it's remarkable. Um, again, I don't know, like, I don't know what the real resolution is, like what you just said, like having a neutral currency and then a decentralized system. How do you, how do you see like a, like a step forward? Well, I, I think what we had in the early days of Bitcoin uh, with the increase of the money supply that goes to the miners um, uh, producing the blocks, I think that was a very novel system of distributing the currency to anonymous contributors uh, in a fair and equal way where anyone can become a money producer by producing blocks. Um, but overall, it is still an indirect subsidy that pays for a service, service being uh, hashing power and security of, of the time chain. Which can be gamified, obviously, and it has been. Exactly, right? And because it's an indirect payment, uh, that is, per definition, leads to malinvestment and overconsumption. Yeah. In the sense that uh, we malinvest into companies like Bitmain, uh, become these huge conglomerates because they just are at the money spigot, right? And they produce from the, or they benefit from the Cantillon effect first. Yeah. Uh, and then we have overconsumption with apps like Satoshi Dice wasting block space uh, <laughs> because they don't have to pay for it, right? Because the payment is done by all the hodlers who get their money supplied or their portion of the money supply diluted with this extra money being produced. Yeah. Uh, so, so I would say that as we see the issuance rate of Bitcoin decreasing over time, uh, it will lead to a more adequate resource allocation of block space, which is the resource we are trading here. I have, I have two things. First, I want to talk about like Mexico's uh, economy. Like, I think that's very, very important. I just wanted to touch on that. But I had one question. What do you, what do you guys think about like these people that say huddle, huddle? Like we all know. Like you know what I mean? Like, do you think that has a positive impact? Because for me, and I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong. And correct me if I'm wrong. I thought it was the people that were using it that allowed Bitcoin to become what it is. You know, I don't think. I think if everyone had the mentality of huddle, like store of value, like what do you think? Like, should it be liquid store of value? Is it like based on person, or what's actually better for the entire ecosystem? Well, I think it, I, I, I definitely think there's been a like a, a bit of a mind, you know, a change in um, uh, the perception of Bitcoin. And obviously, everyone's arguing over, you know, what is Satoshi Nakamoto? What, what, what did he actually mean by cash, etc.? People saying that they meant physical cash. You know payments and then other people saying roll well, cash as in you know as a money as a money type um and i think it's definitely you know we've we've switched from people the the, the focus being on uh, people using it and people spending it and people buying stuff with it to people holding it yeah and to be and it's a store of value it's definitely shifted i think into the store you know to the more to the store of uh, store of value um but the hodling thing certainly uh, well i it didn't benefit me because i i i hodled too long, too yeah. long. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, it's it's like well, it's impossible to know when to stop hodling, mm -hmm. and there's no kind of. I had an article recently where they interviewed me, and I said we should have hodl plus profits. If you're up two thousand mm -hmm. percent, if you're up ten thousand percent, take some profits. Yeah. Like it's an amazing thing. It went up that much. Unfortunately, markets tend to cycle up and down. We can't just stay up forever. It's not going to go straight up forever. Uh, we think it does. And yeah, you're not going to catch the exact top. You're not going to catch the exact bottom. But uh, if ten, selling 10% would change your life, selling 10% gets you out of debt, selling 10% gets you a month off where you can you know, focus and get a new job that you like or something like that. Sell the 10%. You just said that, like you said, if it gets you out of debt, do it. And I had a friend in Australia, this was in 2013. And like it, it peaked a bit, right? Yeah. And uh, he had like 40 or $50,000 in debt. And he and he used it to pay it off. Yeah. I like it's gonna make me sound like an idiot, but I don't mind. Oh, um, I, do. yeah. <laughs> I was like, what are you doing? Why did you sell it? And he said straight out, he goes, Man, I had a forty or fifty thousand dollar debt. I no longer have that. I go, What else could I want? And I'm like, like I didn't get it then, you know? Well, I, look, it, I did the same thing. I paid off my debt uh, near the top. And it's it's not fun at all. You're taking you know tranches of like yeah. five thousand dollars. You're selling something you love. You're buying something that you don't care about. Sure, you spent the money. You got the stuff back then, but you don't remember what it was. You're just buying you know random chunks of get me out of debt, get me out of debt. And then even then, you know it doesn't work. I'm back in debt now. Yeah. But I'm in less debt. So you you have to make some kind of moves. You have to do some reasonable things. And 
you know, if you're up 2000%, if you're up 10,000%, if you're up these or even double, triple, these normal numbers, yeah. normal stock market numbers, you got to take some profits. And yeah, it could go up more, but it could go down. Yeah. I mean, even, you know, yesterday we bought drinks and sodas and whatever. And today Bitcoin's down two, 3%. So we're up on the drinks and sodas for once. <laughs> um, but again, am I going to properly rebuy? Do I have the patience and the diligence to get 40 bucks back in there or whatever? Yeah. Probably not. I'm not that organized. Uh, no one is. But, <laughs> and nobody plays it right. That's the other thing. Everyone's, they, uh, a lot of the fortune tellers and the mind readers and the kind of people we have out there seem infallible because they're presenting this false choice where they say, if Bitcoin, like right now, it's, um, I got this little ticker here, oh, 70, wow, no, 79.09. Oh, so let's do awesome. the old fortune telling. If Bitcoin goes above 8,000, it will go to 8,500. <laughs> but if Bitcoin goes below 7,800, it could go to 75. It's usually yeah. accommodated with the triangle. What thing kind of that, information? Yeah. <laughs> what kind of information have I given you? Really, nothing. nothing. I've given you no actual information. I don't have skin in the game. I'm just telling you this. Yeah. I'm just a magical predictor here. You're saying you can go up, or it you could can go, go up, down. or it could go down. You're like no and, shit. And, and then <laughs> when it when it goes up tomorrow, I'll claim that I was right. Yeah. It went up, and then it went up higher. So you should have listened to me. And when it goes down, I'll say I was right. It went down. And it went lower. So you should listen to me. And I'm afraid that people desperately want to be rich and they want to improve their lives. And this is a positive thing, uh, but they don't want to do any work. They don't want to do any research and they don't want to take any risk. Yeah. So they just trust these gurus and they watch the guru show every day. And it's self-reinforcing because the guru believes himself. Yeah, they got like 200,000 followers. Obviously, he yeah. must know something. And the, the guru is allegedly trading the market, but a lot of them don't even do that. They just predicted on their their magic charts and whatever. Yeah, and they yeah, yeah. Show, show speaking about spin, skin in the game, right? Yeah, don't yeah. show me or don't talk about your portfolio. Show, show, yeah, me. Exactly. show me. Yeah, yeah. 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 Have, Not, it, have it live, have it tra trackable. I mean, well, you, and you've that's, got platforms like eToro and whatever that you can do you know, copy trading on and stuff. So why, why don't they go on there? And a BitMEX as because well. Because when they lose money on there, they'd have to come on and cry. Yeah. And that's the honest truth. And they, none of them cry. There None was... of them have any emotions. They're all sociopaths. <laughs> and they really just want your money. You are the product and they want your money. In 2002, so... um, Richard Wiseman did a, um, a test where he had a, um, a, you know, a prominent city trader, you know, very you know, senior analyst um, and a three-year-old girl. Uh, and uh, uh, I don't know, like, a, oh, you know, it wasn't a donkey. It was like a, oh, it, was, it, was, it, it was an astrologist or something okay. like that. Yeah, Fair enough. Psychic. Very, very similar to a donkey. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, there was, I think there was another one replicated with like a monkey uh, or something. We but, used to um, play bingo with chicken and where the chicken would go. That's yeah. the bingo oh, that what, would like win. South Park where they lop his head off and they're like, no, no, it, raise was, the dead, raise it the, was horrible. And it was banks. middle school. No, it's called chicken shit bingo. And wherever the chicken shits, that's the winning square. Oh, oh, nice. wow. Very fun well, to watch. Well, this the interesting thing about this was that the, the order of um, so the, the person who, who was successful was the three year old girl. Nice. Then the psychic, <laughs> and then the, then the you know analyst. So it just that kind of stuck in my head because I thought surely if there's a science to reading the charts, I mean you could you know if it was predictable, then surely like. You would just have an automated system that just makes money. Like, you know, there and, and why would you share it? And why wouldn't you, you be on a beach? Wouldn't you be happy? And wouldn't you be ridiculously wealthy? And yeah. uh, a lot of these people don't seem ridiculously wealthy. They charge you for everything. The conference, the dinner, going out to wherever. Everything has a fee. There's a workshop. There's a book. There's a brochure. You just have to buy it all to be successful. Yeah. You just haven't bought enough. Please buy some more. Go to the conference. Go to the meeting. Oh. Buy the personal training. Like it's weird. are you the product? Who's the product? I heard product? this guy like he's like oh, some CEO he reads one book a day and I'm like don't you have better something better to do? Like even in the skin of the game it says like you're better off reading the same book like multiple times than reading like one book and just putting it to the side. Yeah, I read one book a day. Like I'll be like like I don't I'm not like and do you ever think about the book? Yeah, you know yeah. Yeah. those <laughs> thoughts pass through your head. You can yeah. compare it with any of the other books, or yeah. they just go in a blur. I, I know I've been there where I read uh two or three Vonnegut books back to back and they all blend together. And I can't tell you story elements from each one. They're like three big books. No, head, let's see. So. It just blends in, man. Yeah. You guys know about the Zapatista movement? No, go ahead. Zapatista movement is so interesting. See, like for me, it's like incredible. Like we're all like sort of 
from that aspect quite interested in these movements. So it's an anarchist movement that started in 1994 uh, to protect the indigenous community in Chiapas, a state in Mexico, and it's grown to contain now between 150 to 300,000 people. Um, and it's absolutely autonomous. So they have no support, whether it's from health, education, electricity, resources, anything to do with Mexico. Obviously, Mexico's army came in during the early years, tried to stop them, but the uprise was very strong. And they came to a point where they were able to uh, withhold their position. And now they are fully disconnected from, uh, from the entire economy. And their hospital system is so good that if you're sick, they actually send you there. They're like, well, they got better facilities. So they, they produce their own, you know, tobacco, uh, chocolate, honey, a lot of other things. And, you know, they turn over like hundreds of thousands, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars per year. And Noam Chomsky named their university as a very holistic university, you know, and like Noam Chomsky is a very intelligent human being. So if he says something, I looked into it. And I went and visited their university in uh, Chiapas, in San Cristobal, and uh, it was incredible. You walk into this building, so I'm used to like a normal university. It's just like you're falling asleep. You know what I mean? Um, I remember my, oh, anyway. Uh, and then you walk in, it's just like all colorful, like beautiful music playing. You're like, this is fun. Inspiring. Yeah, inspiring. Yeah. Like you walk in, you're like, I could learn some stuff here. Mm. You know, I could spend some time. You walk into one room, it's all colorful, indigenous kids. A lot of them don't even speak Spanish. Um, they, you know, any indigenous kids can come in and just like t take part in their program. So on Thursdays, they have an opening session where anyone from outside can come be shown a tour. And uh, you go in and I went to the, I guess the director of the university, but they call it something else in a different way. And uh, I was like, man, like, can I interview you? I would love to learn. He's like, no, it's like, I'm a nobody. What do you care about me? Go look at the university. I'm like, no other university, like professor would ever say yeah. that. You know, they'll be like, make an appointment and we'll oh, see. Oh, yeah, oh, you know? Like, Take a seat, oh. let me he tell gave, you all about it. Yeah, he, <laughs> gave me a, he gave me a hug. His room was filled with plants and beautiful stuff. And I was like, wow, you're a really nice guy, man. Mm. And then walking around one room is like people learning how to play guitar. Another room, they're learning how to, you know, uh, shape wood or, uh, you know, be a mechanic or use electrical equipment, like actual functional stuff that you can do something useful for society, not like be, anyway. Um, I, I do like uh, comparing the difference between what you thought college would be like versus what college was actually like. Uh, <laughs> I definitely thought that it would be the academy and all the kind of everyone suddenly turns on a switch and they're interested in knowledge and learning and you get there and it's a lot more like, we're interested in partying and hooking up and going out and uh, no one's studying and everyone's going late to class. And, and I don't think that's just at the smaller college I went to, even at the harder ones, uh, I don't think it's so much about learning. It's about stress and stress learning and that the, the dedicated ones are the crazy ones. And there's not that, not many of these dedicated to learning ones where they're, yeah. they're crazy about it for the learning. It's bread houses. It's about yeah. the status as status. well. Like yeah. a lot of times um, uh, I see this, like in Australia, we don't really have this system, but in Netherlands, they definitely do. And in the United States, obviously they do as well, where it's like, I need to get into this bread house. So I need to like appeal to them and like be, be accepted because later they will look after me and be my brothers and sisters and help me with jobs. And I'm like, you're teaching someone at such a young age that this is the way to progress. Do you know what I mean? That there's no value in you unless you become a part of the, you know, part of the part of the group. And if we accept you and so will everyone else. And that is so toxic, you know, and I, yeah, sorry. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And, and then on the education side, they, they teach you trivia, random facts. And then you have to repeat that trivia at the test to prove if you've learned it adequately. Yeah. But they don't teach you the trivium or how to actually learn, right? And how to take information and figure out if it is actually truthful or false. Mm. Uh, and, and just that inherently uh, just teaches obedience and uh, yeah, just repeat after me and then you're good to go. Yeah, mm. um, absolutely, man. Another aspect with Mexico, apart from the Zapatista movement, which I highly recommend everyone look into it. I mean, it's just like, not to be a part of it, not to like go in there, but just like, it's, it's a well-functioning, off-grid community that's like doing really well for itself it's an example that people should look at because we live in this world where like without democracy there is nothing they don't they have a flat like thing it's autonomous there's no like i'm the leader kind of thing is each, each person each uh, zone has its own uh, autonomous kind of decision making process and like they come as a community and talk about things you know and like it's a good example of alternative way of dealing with things that's one thing and another thing that i did during my research was try to figure out how do you implement cryptocurrencies in countries like Mexico? Um, it's a country that works and functions 50%, if not more, of the country on cash. 
And that for me is remarkable because Netherlands, like right now, cash, you pull out, they look at you a bit weird. They're like, where's your card? You know, we can't track you with this. My friend uh, wanted me to put 10 euros in his bank account in Netherlands. I remember this like two, three years ago, maybe a bit more. And I went to the bank. I'm like, this is his bank account. I would like to put this money in his account. They're like, we don't, we don't do that. I'm like, what do you mean? That's like your sole purpose. Take the money, put it in his account. They're like, no, because we don't know where that money came from. I'm like, what do you mean? Oh, it comes from me. I'm right they're, here. Yeah, they're like, yeah, they're like well, it needs to either be electronically transferred or otherwise, like, we, we, don't, we can't accept your cash. And I'm like, wow. You know, so like, that's why I really love Mexico. It has so much potential in that way. But it's, and at the same time, they're living in the future. Like, they know banks can't be trusted. They know, like, they've been through so many um, events that has taught them that. So at the same time, like, I would love to introduce cryptocurrencies as a way of them using it. And I have been. So I've got two stores in a uh, a cafe and a co-working space called Convivio in Oaxaca to accept it. And then I showed them the whole process. You use BISC, which is a Mexican exchange. Um, so you accept the cryptocurrency, use BISC. If you don't want to keep it, put it into your bank account. But I will come to use it just because you accept it. And because they say to me, why should I do it? I'm like, the first thing I do when I go to a new city is type the name of the city, where to pay with Bitcoin, you know? And then I will go there. Maybe I don't like the food even that much. Maybe it's more expensive. But for me, it's just easier and I want to support that. So I like, I explained this to them. I'm like, maybe you'll get one person a month that will come just for this, you know? And for you, it's like five minutes worth of work after I show them. And then you go into the wallet. So this is the interesting part. As the industrial designer, I, I look at like a product from both the user acts, you know, from the end user and as the developer and like the whole thing involved with it. So a lot of the wallets are actually like not that user friendly. And for me, it's strange. It's 2019. We should have like really beautiful wallets that you type their man, you send it, it comes out, you've accepted. Like, it's not like, it's just very simple things. And I would, I don't, it's like this, you know, again, the skin in the game. It's such a good book, right? Like he was talking about how the trains in New York were redesigned and they used to have a lip where people would put their coffee. After the redesign, they like, oh, let's make it slanted because it looks cooler at a slant. You could no longer put your coffee cup there. And he said the person obviously never rode in the train, didn't understand that, hey, that is beneficial for someone that wants to read the book and place their coffee there. Now it's awkward because i got to read the book while holding my coffee and it just doesn't work. You took away something that people actually use, you know, the function of it. So a lot of times we forget about these very small things that can make a huge difference for the end user. So I've been speaking to a lot of wallet uh, developers and I'm like, please fix these aspects. You've done a great job. I want to promote your wallet. I want to use it. And some of them are closed source. And I'm like, why is it closed source? And they're like, uh, because we support Monero and that's a lot of work. And, you know, we don't want people copying it. And I'm like, oh, man, you don't get it. Why don't you get it? One of the uh, point of sale systems, I'm like, can you add this coin to your uh, list? And they're like, sure, $20,000. I'm like, <laughs> oh, my, come on, man. Like, put, put a small yeah. transaction fee. Don't, don't do that. Don't do that. $20,000 to add a coin. Yeah. You know, well, part of the problem there is that there's no money in wallets. Well, <laughs> well how do you how do you think a wallet makes money? Tell me your story. Actually, actually which wallet actually makes money? Exactly. Well, Savvy Wallet has a beautiful system like this, mm -hmm. right? You have Libra and open source wallet that anyone can use without asking for permission. And then you have an opt in service. For example, a zero link coin join, or for example, lightning channel openings or liquidity mm. providers and such second layer systems. And then for these scare services, right, where only a limited amount of users can actually partake in such a service, that is absolutely a valid business model than to ask for, uh, like for that, it's pennies. What's the percentage? How much is the gross? Well, How many users? Well, for example, Wasabi Wallet has been active since on mainnet since August 1st, 2018. Uh, and uh, the, the fee for a, cord, for a coin join is 0 0.003 percent per annum set or something like this i'm not and, investing i and, take it back when I do actually, you can't hire a designer no you know, video no <laughs> new graphics no you see no that? infographics no, you, you, no. See what, you see what the, the revenue is already way oh over your developers in a bread line he's way he's over 100 bitcoin bread. already and now there are eight full-time developers being paid by the ck snacks company who who can actually decline vc investors mm. because of the profit of uh, revenue there's actually many individuals who wanted to invest into CK Snacks uh, and Nopara specifically said no to them because he did not need the money because he was making enough revenue by providing such an opt-in service. Well, BISC, and, is, sorry, BISC oh, yeah. is a great model as well. They have their own decentralized autonomous organization. They take a bit of the transaction fees with their own currency and they pay all their developers. There's ways around it, but at the end of the day, you need that user base. You know, that's why I asked, like, how many users do they have? Because, like, it's cool. 
But like you need that user base. Without it, it's not gonna work. Well, and okay. subscription fee, twenty five dollars a month, something that you can count on. Oh, yeah. we have a thousand users, twenty five dollars a month. We can hire this many people. We can do it for this many months. People can only cancel at certain times. You have to have some kind of control. You have to have budgets. Otherwise, if you look at the Bitcoin Foundation, we talked about them again the other day. Uh, they were doing a good job. They had lots of money. They were spending it. And then all of a sudden, Bitcoin went down. Suddenly, they had no money. Suddenly, they couldn't spend it. They had to lay everybody off. They It looks like they overspent, but really, it was just a really tough budgetary system where they couldn't plan ahead. You, yeah. And if you can't plan ahead, you can't really have an organization. Yeah, like even so, a decentralized system that produces money for itself, you can lose a lot of users suddenly. Yep. Like when Bitcoin is at its peak, you're like, oh, we're doing great. There's a lot of people using our platform. And then if it's not, like, you know, it... it yeah, well, yeah, and even if the user numbers are there, like we still have fifty-eight thousand subscribers. But after the uh, the twenty seventeen thing, something happened to all of them. Yeah, uh, they all quit YouTube. They deleted yeah, their right. accounts. They're never coming back. <laughs> uh, whatever it is, I they never told me. Um, but yeah, they're all gone. And <laughs> so, like see, being around since two thousand thirteen and coming to this event, Paralini Place, and like seeing you, man, like like yo, OG, man, like much much respect for the people that were around prior to like the high pay inflation and like, you know, everything else. Um, the culture has changed. Like even events like this, the crowd has changed a bit and like mm. the fight has died down a bit. And like a lot of things has definitely changed. Like how, do, how does that affect, I guess, you, you know, the, the work you guys are doing? Oh, one time I went to this conference and I won't say where, it was a very businessy conference. It was a very uh, FinTech conference. Like they say, it's good for sharks. And uh, yeah, you'd go in there and I, you know, I, I do my thing and they're like, oh, what are you doing? I'm like, Oh, I've been making YouTube videos about Bitcoin since 2013. And every single comment was, oh, my God, you must be so rich. Right. And, and I'm like, well, you know, I had a thousand bucks in 2013. And I was out of work. That's why I had the time to make the YouTube videos. Yeah. I get a little bit of donations and thank you. But, you know, it's, it's not enough to live on. And, uh, you know, I, I sell at the wrong times. I have to pay my bills, all these things. It, it goes down. It goes up. I still have to keep selling, which I don't like to do, but I have to pay the bills. And uh, not rich at all. And uh, for these people, it was a huge, I was a huge failure in their eyes uh, because I was not rich after knowing about this since 2013, even knowing about it on Slashdot since 2010 or whatever. Yeah. Um, for them, the minute you find something that's worth money, you should figure out how to capitalize that into more money. Yeah. I found this and I thought, wow, there's limited units. It's sound money. It's electronic. We can send it anywhere in the world. You can send it cheaply. Remittances, yeah. uh, no more banks, no more central banks, all these kind of things, credit cards. Uh, that all sounded great to me. Making money, kind of a secondary thing. It's okay if I make some money. I got bills. You know, It's problems. But for these people, it was all money. It I can fully relate to that, change. man. Every time so, someone says the same thing, I'm like, I know, I get it. In theory, I should yeah, be. Yeah. If I sat at home and I just collected coins, for sure I would be. But you know. But the thing is, oh, sorry, sorry. Okay. But the thing is, like, it's the classic case between Roger Ver and Andreas Antonopoulos. Yeah. Roger Ver was like, "You should be rich. Why yeah. don't you have it? If you bought yeah. it in 2013, he's like, yeah, mate, yeah. I was more focused on handing out bitcoins and like helping people be educated and learn about it. It wasn't a, it wasn't like a financial thing because you could have just sat at home and be like, let me go work for some, you know, massive corporation, bring in 100k a, a year and just keep buying bitcoin." I could have worked at Subway and made more money. You in know, bitcoin. I yeah. mean, and uh, what you said earlier is true here. It's not, I like the hodlers and everything. It's a cool idea. I'm not against it, but it's not the hodlers that built Bitcoin. No. It's, it's my friend out there who, uh, I forget the number now, but I think he spent at least a thousand or at least a hundred, let's say a hundred Bitcoins streaming pornography. He got nothing, right? He got nothing for it. He had a credit card. He had money. There were other ways to pay, but this crazy website would let you pay in this crazy Bitcoin. And yeah. he'd never spent Bitcoin before. No one would ever take his Bitcoin like the pizza guy. 10,000 Bitcoin for two pizzas. Yeah. You know what he was excited about? He could spend that for something, yes. anything yeah. at all. Yeah. And it's it's his sacrifice. It's my friend's sacrifice. Everybody else who's now kicking themselves. Yeah. They bought the alpaca socks for 100 Bitcoins. Those are the people that built this and got the stories written. The people yeah. that donate, like it's not enough for WikiLeaks to accept it. Yeah. Someone has to give them money. Yeah. And that was often someone early. And maybe they didn't have the money. Maybe they gave up a third of their Bitcoins. And now they're like, that's my house in Malibu uh, and WikiLeaks spent it for $300. And, yeah. uh, you know, if they'd held it and if I'd held it and if this and if that, and if you bought this crowd sale and sold that and all this, no one times it right. No one does it right. And 
And then, of course, sadly, the ones who are focused on it are the worst people, and the ones who succeed are the worst people. And uh, they don't give back to the community at all. No. Uh, we have a, a lack of uh, Bitcoin Medicis. Uh, in Florence in the 14th century, the Medicis made all this money doing trading and trading and trading. And sure, they spread goods around and it was good, but they also took this money and they gave it to Leonardo da Vinci. And da Vinci got to sit around and think of things. And he thought about helicopters and uh, aqueducts and flying machines and all the paintings and perspective and all these other things that he was working on. He had time to do that because they gave him money to improve their culture. We don't have that. Mm. Roger, people like him, no offense to Roger, they invest in companies. They want those companies to make more money, to monopolize the industry, to bring them a huge return so that they have more money. It's not interesting. Oh. It's not culture building. It's stacking more money. And there was an interesting Twitter thread, thread recently. I won't say who, but they were celebrating a certain Bitcoin billionaire. And they were saying how great it was that he gets his shoes at Payless Shoes and that he wears free T-shirts from the companies he invests in and that he's a real frugal guy. And of course, he's not helping the community at all. And uh, I saw it as the opposite. First of all, shoes, mattress, uh, food, uh, health care. Like, these are the things you should be buying on. You use your shoes every day. You use your mattress every day. You should have good shoes. See it, right? You, all should, yeah. you all should sleep in hammocks. Let's make that clear. If you want a hammock, oh, yeah. that's fine. But ototherwise, get a new mattress if you haven't had a new mattress in 10 years or whatever. Just, that's where you should spend your 10%. Shoes and mattress. Even the billionaire. And, and then secondly... Uh, I just need him to be much bigger than he is. I need him to see the world bigger. I need him to see his impact bigger. Uh, in this book I'm reading, The Doge Guy, he makes so much money that you know his, his children, his children's children, all these people are rich, but they don't have any direction. They don't have any Carnegie in them. Uh, when Carnegie passed away, he said uh, to his children, pretty much, uh, F you. And Carnegie was the kind of guy who could do that because he made his money grinding it out in the steel industry and he undercut nice. everyone, he undercut everyone. But then he took that money, put it into a trust. They created the Carnegie Mellon Library System and the Carnegie Mellon Colleges and all this educational program. And sure, he made the money through dirty means, but it ended up in colleges and libraries. Good on Carnegie. On the other hand, we have Rockefeller. Rockefeller, they just kept making money. They move it from this. They move it from that. They make it there. They make it here. They build this. They build this business. They're about monopolizing industries. Same as Carnegie. But at the end, there's no foundation. There's no donations. There's no end of it. And uh, we're seeing a little bit of that coming back now, the Carnegie with uh, Bill Gates and uh, Mark Zuckerberg and maybe even Warren Buffett planning to donate a substantial sum of their charity, of uh, their funds. Unfortunately, when they die, we have to wait um, to charity. And they do hospitals and things, but just taking large lump sums of it and saying, your children are going to be okay. Maybe it wouldn't be too bad if they had to work. Maybe society could be better. And I don't know if we have any of those people in Bitcoin. I don't know where they are. Maybe they haven't seen our shows or our struggle uh, and that we don't have any fortune tellers or advertisements or nonsense. And by avoiding all the nonsense, we are broke. By avoiding all the fortune tellers, we are broke. Like we could have sold you a thousand scams and a terrible altcoin that would shit the bed all over your house. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we didn't, right? We didn't, right? We had people donate. And even then I get these messages. Oh, I wish I never donated to World Crypto Network because I'd have so much more money. You people know? say and, that. Oh, yeah, That's yeah. Disgusting. Oh, I had, to, yeah, I had to kick that guy out of the comments, which I don't like to do. But, you know, what? I, I asked for money. You gave me $20. Like, I'm sorry. You want your $20 back because it's worth $200 now. I don't have it. It's gone. Like, yeah. I spent it. It's, you know, money's gone. But, they think, of course, I'm sitting on all of it or whatever because I'm traveling the world, you know, but I'm sleeping on couches. I'm in the cheapest Airbnbs. You I, know? I, I struggle when I buy a, an expensive Uber to continue traveling or whatever it is. You have and to that's spend like money. The, the last, uh, you, you've been oh, sorry. 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 I was Do just going to say, going, so going back there, you, you know, you, you lived and you use Bitcoin. The reason why you're not you know, sinking rich because you use Bitcoin for what was its intended purpose was, which was money. So yeah. you, you, you yeah. bought it. You bought you you got your Bitcoin, and then you use it to buy stuff. Now the, the the someone pointed out on Twitter, and I think it's a really good point, is that if you have that mentality, then you could also say, well, why did you spend five pound on a pack of cigarettes? Because you should have bought Bitcoin instead. You know, yeah, everything yeah. you you could boil back down to, oh, that was a bad decision. So I, I could have you know could have bought Bitcoin. And my ticket out of Australia when my whole journey like started in Europe. 
I went from Sydney to Amsterdam. I paid a thousand dollars for that one way ticket because I was just like, I'm going, I'm going to do this, man. And it was worth what I spent in cryptocurrency to pay for that was worth like $1.1 million three, three, three years later. But and you I see, tell this to people. And yeah. I'm like, I don't give a fuck. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. you see, the thing is, it, it's, it's, it's bad to think about it. Oh, you spent that Bitcoin and now it's gone and you have the opportunity cost of holding it and having more. But the thing is, why do you still hold fiat if you have that mindset, right? Uh, if you really have that mindset, then you should sell all your fiat, be in Bitcoin only, mm. and then spend what the minimum amount that you need to consume or produce with. Right? Like you turn the table there, buddy. Because then, <laughs> then, you're, then you're taking on risk. And these people don't want risk. They only want gains. Mm. The, the real thing, if you look at somebody like Roger or whatever, and you want to say, maybe Roger doesn't deserve a billion dollars. Roger went in early. He went in early with a lot of money, sort of percentage-wise. I don't know what it is. Sure, maybe he had a business. He had more money than I did or somebody else. But he went in early when no one believed in it. He held it long. He waited for the right moment. And when he sold, he sold for more. So he deserves to keep his gains. Yeah. Those are his gains. Yeah. Uh, we, and he can spend them however he wants. Yeah. I'm not saying he has to be Mr. Community. And uh, it's great to see uh, him do Bitcoin.com and really – serve that be cash community <laughs> and really shovel that down and all the traveling and all of this. And yeah. a, a lot of people have told me they think that, um, they think that Roger thinks that he's the reason that Bitcoin took off, that his individual activism oh, wow. going around to okay. things. And of course, you know, I like the mad Bitcoin show. I like world crypto network. I think we've helped, you know, some people, For sure. but in yeah. general, Never you know, we got on a boat that's going up. Yeah. Bitcoin's awesome. I saw it's awesome. Other people see it's awesome. Everybody gets in. Yeah. We're all getting on the same boat. It's not necessarily, you know, one person or no, one if organization. You start thinking like that, then you don't up. understand yeah. decentralization. Then you don't understand the network effect, you know, like and that, that's why he thinks he can do it again the B cash. Uh, it would be just that easy. Uh, like remember how easy it was going to those meetings and then Bitcoin's three dollars and it's a hundred dollars and it's three thousand yeah. and all this. He he has that vision for the B cash. He's a billionaire. And and what I do don't know that, that he has the technical chops up. You, you see, and he did the same thing with B cash. I mean B cash used to be 0.2 Bitcoin, then it was 0.1 Bitcoin, then it was 0.01 Bitcoin, and soon it'll be zero Bitcoin. I mean that's fantastic. He did the same thing, but this way kind Other of like the wrong way down. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll leave it on that note, guys. Thanks for having me because I think someone else is waiting to jump in, I'm right? Quite sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, Amina, where can people find more oh, about yeah. you and your just, project? Just so you know yeah. about me. My name is Amin Rafi. I'm at the moment living in Oaxaca, but you know, I, I go around to different events. Uh, I guess I've been around since 2013. I am working on a project called 1M5, which we would love donations or contributors or developers working on it. You can find it at one number one M for Mary number five uh, dot io. And uh, yeah, like you can go on there and like see all the details there. And me personally, my name is Amin Rafi and my website is A, A for Alpha, Rafi, R for Roger, A for Alpha, F for Fred, I for India, double E for Echo. And I'll post it up somewhere so you can find it. It's, uh, man, I love you guys, man. All right, Rafi, one more on. thing. You have to give me your line about what if I need a blockchain? I am your blockchain therapist. <laughs> I will look at your project, man. Like someone sent me a white paper the other day and I'm like, this blockchain therapist thing could actually be like into a real thing. Like look at it and be like, the doctor is like not very happy, you know? Like you don't need a blockchain, you need a therapist. You need a blockchain therapist, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Solve your problems. Get Solve rid of that it. blockchain that you think you need. <laughs> Thank you, man. Thanks I so really much. appreciate Thank it. You. Cheers, man. Pleasure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks, mate. Oh, wait, uh, one more quick one shout out. Uh, what is the name of your documentation? Um, it's in progress, but I'm going to call it the age of decentralization. Fantastic. Pierce, it's check that I've out. been interviewing really amazing people. Luke Rudolfsky, I interviewed him in uh, Anarchapolka, Smuggler from Upstairs. Are very, very amazing people with beautiful minds that are part of it. I'm just putting it together. If you want to contribute to that as well, find me on Telegram and like, I would love to have it. I want to make it open source like I spoke to you, make the script so people can contribute to it, take the video files and do whatever you feel like you want to do to it because I believe it should be, you know, age of decentralization, the documentary somehow should be decentralized. Um, I would actually like to have you guys on it at some stage as well, but we'll get around sure. to it after the show. <laughs> that sounds Thank great. you. Awesome. Cheers. Cheers. Bye-bye. 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 We'll see you soon. Yeah, so I think Coinshaw, he's, uh, he's just popped upstairs for, for a minute.